Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Immunotherapy and Desensitization, Understanding the Dose I React to and How Does Immunotherapy Change That? I am Jennifer Gertz, Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada, and today our expert joining us is Dr. Philippe Bijan. Before we get started, I'd like to note a few items. Note that this session is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis, or treatment. Please talk to your doctor about any concerns or questions you may have regarding your own health or the health of your child. All participants are muted, so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions upon re registration. There are some common questions that we will tackle in today's session. If you have additional questions during the session, please submit them in the chat question box throughout the webinar, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. And this webinar will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards. First, some background on the session. Back in 2008, or 2018, pardon me, we did our first in-depth session on oral immunotherapy. And at that time, the treatment focused predominantly on peanut, access was limited, and it was generally available only in clinical trial settings, the work required to establish treatment safety and efficacy. Now, five years later, much more has been learned. Canadian guidelines exist for oral immunotherapy in Canada, and some allergists are in fact offering oral immunotherapy in their clinical practices, and there's been much more study on different forms and routes of immunotherapy. Today's session will cover some of the basics, including what is immunotherapy, how does it work, and understanding key concepts such as desensitization and thresholds. It will also provide a view into the different routes of immunotherapy, including oral, oral immunotherapy or OIT, which is available today, but also other forms that are in the pipeline, including EPIT, which is through the skin, and SLIT, which is under the tongue. To answer these questions, we are truly fortunate to be joined today by Dr. Philippe Bejean. Dr. Bejean is an expert and a pioneer in this treatment area, whose leadership led to the first OIT clinic being established in Canada, and that started with a pilot project in 2017 at St. Justine's Hospital in Montreal. Dr. Bejean is a clinician scientist and assistant professor at CHUM and St. Justine's Hospital and teaches allergy and immunology at the University of Montreal. He's on the board of directors of the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology and is a member of Food Allergy Canada's Healthcare Advisory Board. Before I turn the session over to Dr. Bejean, we'd like to get a sense of who's joined us in the listening audience. So we have a quick poll that we would like you to complete. So the poll question is, please select the age range of the person whom you might be considering food allergen immunotherapy for. Check all the boxes that apply. So is it zero to three, four to 17, or 18 and above? And so, and if you're a healthcare provider, of course, you can be selecting all of those things. If you're an individual, uh, you select what's appropriate for your family. All right, we'll give that a couple of minutes and let's see what we've got here. So we've got uh, just under 20% of our audience is in the zero to three, 77 in the four to 17, then the remaining 18 and above. Okay, so with that information, uh, Dr. Bejan, we'd like to thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to be with us today, and I'd like to turn it over to you. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be with you uh, uh, for this uh, lunch session to discuss uh, uh, food allergy and oral immunotherapy. Um, so, so the focus for this session, oh, so the, the, these are my disclosures. Um, so the focus of the session today, um, I, I, I will try to keep it uh, short so we have time for questions uh, afterwards. I'm really going to focus on um, how oral immunotherapy works, so the, the mechanisms uh, underneath oral immunotherapy, how I explain it to uh, patients. So I'm not going to present statistics uh, on studies that have been done uh, and, you know, percentages and that kind of stuff. It's, it's really more uh, about uh, what happens to your body when you do oral immunotherapy and then if it's, you know, something that could work for you. But everyone is different, uh, so whether it's those different aspects are going to work or not for you uh, really depends on your underlying allergy. If it's something that's worthwhile, depends on your personal uh, objectives. So it's really something that you, you need to discuss with your, your doctor or your, uh, your allergist. 
uh, but the, the concepts that I present here is something that is uh, usually not necessarily uh, covered in, in general presentations on oral therapy. So hopefully you'll be able to learn uh, something uh, something uh, different from what you've uh, you've heard uh, before. So first I'm going to start with what is a, a food allergy. So when we consider food allergy, uh, we from a scientific point of view we think. Um, that um, it, it originates from a mistake of the body where the immune system sees food, which is not dangerous, as something dangerous, potentially like a parasite. So normally, the immune system, that's made of the white blood cells in your body, it, it surveils everything that you encounter and will determine what you do with it. And usually when you encounter viruses and, and bacteria, you're going to produce regular uh, antibodies, which, which are going to target the bacteria in this case, and it's going to allow your white blood cells to chase out after it and eventually eat it up, digest it, and kill it. During evolution, we also started developing another type of antibodies, which are called the IgE, um, and they're made to protect us against parasites. The problem with parasites is that they're really, really big, so the white blood cells, they're bigger than the white blood cells. They couldn't be eaten up by the white blood cells. So we developed those new antibodies, the IgE antibodies, which will target the, the parasite and allow your body to attack it without trying to eat it. So your, your body is going to create an environment that's really uh, bad for the parasite. Uh, so it's going to irritate it and potentially create a reaction to throw it out of the body. So this antibody is the IgE, and this is the antibody that we develop against food um, allergen. The way it works, it, it's going to arm a special white blood cell that you have all over your body. It's called the mast cell. And it really works like a landmine. So everyone has those white blood cells, whether you're allergic or not. The difference is that if you're allergic, you are going to produce the allergic antibody, the IgE, and this is going to arm your mast cell. So it's going to allow it to recognize what it should react against. So once you have your mast cell in your body that is armed with your IgE, when you encounter the parasite, that's going to trigger the mast cell to, we say, degranulate. So it's going to release the content of those granules there and it's going to create an environment that's really irritant and it's going to help get the parasite out of there. So during evolution, imagine you're, you're Tarzan, you're in the jungle and you catch a parasite in the foot. So you have mast cells there and Tarzan has seen those parasites before so he developed those protective antibodies, those IgE antibodies. So those mast cells are armed. So when he sees the parasite again, it's going to trigger a reaction everywhere the parasite touches those mast cells. So if you see here, there's really a hive around everywhere the parasite touched. So it's really, really itchy. You can imagine that uh, Tarzan doesn't cut his nails. So, so when he scratches, he's probably going to be able to get the, the parasite uh, out of there, hopefully. So, so the mast cells, they release histamines. That's why antihistamines work and it's going to decrease the, the, the itching. Um, but histamine has different effect depending on where you're uh, in the body. So Tarzan also has mast cells in the gut. So in the gut, what's going to happen when the mast cell releases histamine is not itching. It's going to be more like diarrhea and vomiting. So again, uh, a reaction that's going to help get the parasite out of the body. If you're in the lungs, it's going to trigger bronchospasms so and close the lung. It's going to secrete mucus and create a cough reflex. So really pff, try to throw the invader out. So that's really good when it's one lung with a parasite in it. Not that good when it's all your uh, bronchus, bronchi that are, that are closing at the same time, obviously. In the nose, the eyes, the mouth is going to itch, going to make you sneeze, going to make you uh, tear up. So again, all those, those are reflexes to get the invader out of your system. Now, the problem is that in 2023, Tarzan uh, encounters peanut and, and he becomes allergic to peanut. He starts developing those IgE antibodies against peanut by mistake. So what's going to happen is that everywhere the peanut touches is going to trigger the same reaction. So when it's in the mouth, it's going to start itching. And when he swallows the uh, allergen, it's going to itch in the throat. When it reaches the stomach, uh, he might vomit, he might get diarrhea in a few hours. Um, but the thing with food, contrary to a parasite, is that you're, you're going to digest it and potentially you're going to absorb the allergen and it's going to go in your bloodstream and potentially get distributed all over your body. So potentially, if you eat enough and you're allergic enough, you could activate all of the mast cells in your body at the same time and trigger all those local reactions, which were really good to get rid of the antibody invading a specific part of your body. Those reactions are going to get triggered all the same time and that's dangerous. This is what we call anaphylaxis. So when we talk about anaphylaxis, 
as doctors, uh, we establish uh, rules to identify, so we say two systems that are affected. Uh, that's really just to recognize it in clinic. But from a biological point of view, when you think of anaphylaxis, it's really an allergic reaction when the allergen has gone into your bloodstream. So that would be a more biological definition of it. So when we think about anaphylaxis, we always think of this severe reactions that we see uh, in movie or that you might have experienced uh, yourself. Um, anaphylaxis is always presented as the worst potential reaction you can have to an allergen, which is true. But here's a question or a true or false statement. So and j there's no poll, just answer in your head so we uh, save time. Is anaphylaxis always severe? Yes or no? So three seconds up. So the answer is, that's actually false. You can have mild anaphylaxis, and that's how we rate it. We have criteria to rate it in, uh, in research. So it can't be mild. The moment you have a systemic reaction, meaning that you know you have symptoms in your nose and in your, your skin, uh, but those could be mild symptoms, which are not life-threatening, they're not dangerous. It can be life-threatening, it can be a severe reaction, uh, but most of the time, it will remain mild or moderate. That the severe life-threatening cases are actually the exception. And we often talk about anaphylactic shock, but shock in medicine is really a term referring to your, your blood pressure being very, very low from the reaction in this case. Um, in reality, when we think of everyone that actually dies from food anaphylaxis, shock is rare. 90% of people that die from food allergy don't even die from shock, they die from the asthma attack. That's actually a bigger concern than the shock. The shock obviously can kill you, but the uh, asthma attack is worse. So, so the thing that's most important with someone that has food allergy is to make sure they have controlled asthma. Because if you have a very bad reaction and you have asthma, then it's gonna go in your lung and that's where you can potentially be uh, in trouble. So, if there's a range of severity of food allergy, why haven't we ever talked about it before? Well, the thing is, 20 years ago, um, it was kind of new. I mean, food allergy has been around for much longer than this, but we have had this allergy epidemic, so we have more food allergy and it's more severe for tons of reasons we will not be going into uh, uh, today. Um, so, so there was a need for educating uh, the public and making sure people understood that this is serious and you need to treat it and treat it fast. So, so there was a lot of messaging around the fact that it's a potentially life-threatening disease. It even went into the definition of the, the, the condition. So when we talk about anaphylaxis and the definition itself that it's potentially life-threatening, even though pneumonia kills way more people than food allergy and anaphylaxis, and it, that doesn't have life-threatening in its definition, but people already understand that pneumonia can kill you if you don't, don't treat it. There really was a need to explain that it was, and, and get that message out that it was serious. The problem with this is that now everyone thinks that all food allergies are the same, and that's not true. There is a range of severity. But now the big problem that we have is how do we define this severity? Be, is it going to be the severity of the reaction? But that's a problem because if I have a big reaction to a big amount of food, am I really truly more severe than the person that had a mild reaction to a very tiny amount of food, which I don't even react to? So obviously there, there, there's, there's a problem comparing the two here. We're going to talk about the free frequency of reactions, but that's totally dependent of whether I'm being careful or not. So, so um, at some point, some people suggested that that would be the criteria, but we, we were in the kind of ridiculous situation when we have patients that we know are extremely severely allergic, but because they're extremely careful and never had a reaction, they would not be considered severe cases and wouldn't be prioritized for uh, for treatment. So that, that made no sense. Um, in research, the way we define it, we say, well, what's the likelihood of you having a reaction to a specific standardized amount of the food? And that's how we, uh, we typically measure it. And that can be done uh, by doing an oral food challenge. So you might have uh, done that in, uh, in clinic with your allergist uh, in the past. So the idea that's a gold standard to, uh, to uh, diagnose a food allergy consists of actually giving the food at the clinic in a controlled manner. So we start obviously with a tiny amount of the food, which most people will tolerate. Then if that's okay, we're gonna go with a higher amount and then wait 20 minutes and give a bit more up to a full serving of the food. So the way that was used before was really just for diagnostic purposes. And because we didn't really make a difference between severe allergy and less severe allergy, uh, it was a dichotomic answer. Either you're allergic or you're not. So we 
try to reach the full serving of the food. And if you react, even if it takes you 30 peanuts to react and you have a mild reaction, or if you have a severe anaphylaxis to trace amount, the conclusion would be you're allergic, so you avoid and you carry your uh, auto injector around. And uh, you know we, we give you the same speech basically regardless. Um, in uh, research, we would use the food challenge to define response to treatment. So already, we were already using it to kind of assess severity of allergy and improvement of allergy. So we would say, well, what's the amount, the smallest amount of food that will elicit a standard set of symptoms that was predefined depending on the protocol for that particular uh, research uh, project. But now what we're we're doing is that we're using the food challenge more and more in clinic um, to establish that the threshold to see well what's the amount that's going to make you react so can you tolerate the small amount can you tolerate uh, trace amounts and also what kind of symptoms are you getting when you're actually getting this uh, this reaction so if you're okay you're reacting to high doses but when you react you get anaphylaxis or yeah you react to high doses but the only thing it does is itching in your mouth even though i've already i've given you 50 uh, peanuts um we, we recognize that this is a different uh, situation so if you i said it didn't have any statistics but uh, i actually have some right here <laughs> so so uh, if you take everyone that's allergic to peanut and you challenge them what do you expect so we're going to have a range of different uh, results and we expect that about 20 percent of people that think they're allergic they have positive tests they have a history of having reacted to, to peanuts in the past well 20 peanuts will actually reach the full dose of the challenge and not react on that day of the challenge and what's interesting is that 60 people 60 percent of people will reach half a peanut on uh, on that challenge so if you look here about 35 to 40 percent people will need 100 milligrams so that's that's uh, about half a peanut to react and when you look at you know trace amounts so five or ten uh, milligram and below you have only five percent of your uh, population that will react to small amounts like 2.3 uh, milligram so it's a minority of people but it's a minority of people that have very severe um, allergy so when do you think of it? Of it? I mean, it, it's interesting to know how severe uh, you are. Um, and you say, well, you know, 5%, that's a lot. Uh, so, so we should probably tell people just to, to eat no peanut. But just, just to give you a bit more on this, well, even if I say that 5% of people will react to this small amount of 2.3 milligram, I'm not saying that all of these people will have a systemic anaphylactic reaction. So if you take all the people that actually have uh, 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 objective reaction that you can see within that 5%, there's only 5% that will actually get anaphylaxis at that small dose. And within those that get anaphylaxis, it's important to know that you know anaphylaxis is not necessarily severe. 80% of anaphylaxis will resolve spontaneously without any treatment. We know that from our experience of all those patients that don't give themselves epinephrine and show up at, at the uh, ER and eventually just get better on its own. And even in those that do get epinephrine, most people will respond to one epinephrine. Um, so so the, 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 the risk of reacting at a very small, like 2.3 milligram and dying from it is less than one in a million. That's taking people allergic with confirmed allergy to uh, peanut. So it really helps, puts it in, uh, in perspective. And, and knowing your threshold, your risk, uh, will help you. The goal is really not to say that food allergy is not dangerous and you don't need to worry about it, but it's to help you gauge the risk so you can live with the, the food allergy and see if a treatment that might actually change this might be helpful for you or not. Um, so just some other statistics that are interesting. So shellfish, we have 30% of people with shellfish allergy uh, diagnosis that can actually tolerate it when we do a full challenge. And 90% of people that are allergic to shellfish can actually tolerate at least one, you know, the tiny small shrimps that we put in the uh, shrimp uh, salads. Uh, when you consider soy, that's even worse. 80% of people that are tagged as allergic to soy can actually tolerate soy on a challenge. And amongst those that are uh, actually allergic, 40% can tolerate 10 milliliters of uh, soy milk. Okay, true or false, again, just, uh, again, just in your head. So thresholds can vary over time. Is that true or is this false? So this is true, um, but it's not completely random so you need to be careful if you do a challenge that tells you oh you reacted with these symptoms at exactly that dose 
it, it's not a given. I mean, the next day you could react at a higher or a lower dose and the symptoms could be slightly uh, different. But there are explanations for these uh, variations. So one explanation obviously is that your food allergy can evolve over time. So if you've just been diagnosed with a food allergy, we know that the evolution of an allergy is that it will progressively Im uh, amplify uh, over time. If you take uh, peanut allergy, 80% of people will have uh, long-term peanut allergy, 20% it will go away on itself. But in those 80% that have this um, permanent food allergy, usually you're going to see the IgE antibodies just go up and up and up in the first two or three years of life. Usually at some point it will stabilize and stop uh, changing. The, the natural evolution of a shrimp allergy is that usually that appears in, in adults and it starts with just itching in the mouth or a little tummy ache or, or nausea which gets worse with every exposition and at some point people keep eating it because they they, they like it uh, so despite the symptoms they eat it and it gets worse and eventually they get the uh, the anaphylaxis so obviously this is a change that's due to the progression of the underlying uh, allergy but even if your allergy doesn't change, there are other factors that stimulate your mass and make them more prone to react or that affect your digestion and might affect the way you absorb the allergen. So, so we call those cofactors. So this includes physical exercise, fever, uh, NSAIDs are uh, aspirin and, and Advil types of drugs, um, alcohol, uh, asthma, allergies, menses for women, and uh, just general fatigue and sleep uh, deprivation. So what, what cofactors do is they, they can, one factor is if you have fever, if you're sick, um, well, your, your mast cell is an immune cell, uh, so it's going to respond to that. So it's going to make it uh, more, more ticklish, more prone to react because there's already stimulation. If you're in, in your allergy season, there are, are already other IgE antibodies that are activated on the surface because of the pollen. So it takes less to activate your, your mast cells. So your threshold for your mast cell to react will be lower. So the amount that usually you'd be able to tolerate uh, 500 milligrams because your threshold's at 5,000, well now your threshold's a bit lower so that two peanuts will make you react while it wouldn't uh, otherwise. The other mechanisms is um, anything that affects the barrier of the stomach. So we know when you increase your body temperature, it's it basically uh, screws up uh, the, the the stomach uh, barrier. Um, so so you can get that with fever, you get that with uh, exercise, uh, alcohol, and and anti-inflammatory drugs like Advil and aspirin directly irritate uh, the stomach. So usually when you eat the food, you're going to digest most of it, and a little bit of it will go in your bloodstream and potentially give your anaphylactic symptoms. But let's say that you eat the food under the amount that usually makes you react, and then you go for a run an hour and a half after eating the food. Usually you would have reacted within an hour after eating the food because it got absorbed, but it's still there in your stomach. Now you go for a run, you increase your body temperature, the, the, the cells in your, your stomach, uh, they kind of let go of each other and the allergen can go through between them and enter your bloodstream. So the allergen is gonna spike, the concentration is gonna spike in your bloodstream and that might be enough to trigger reactions while normally they would have been digested and you would not uh, be, uh, uh, you might get the reaction. Uh, interesting study that came out of uh, Toronto, um, they looked at patients that had uh, had reactions multiple times at the ER. What's interesting is that, yes, your threshold is going to change because of all those factors, but the type of reactions that you get usually is the same. So some people, we have a certain sequence of symptoms. I, it starts with my stomach, then it gets in my lungs and in my nose. Uh, some people say, well, for me, it's, it's, it's mostly uh, hives that appear out of nowhere all over my body. It's usually the same over time. So that's very interesting because you can learn to know your own allergy and you can see the allergy coming later on. So if you have a reaction to a food at the lower amounts, uh, you, you can trust your, uh, your, your symptoms. All right. Now, um, what what do you do if you have a reaction? So, so the mainstay treatment for an allergic reaction, you know, is epinephrine. And the reason we want people to give epinephrine, there's two of them. One is that it treats the symptoms of anaphylaxis, but the other one is that it turns off the allergy cells. It turns off the mast cells. So we want people, even if they have a low threshold, if they're going to expose themselves to the food. Uh, or not, they should still be carrying their epinephrine. And if you're doing oral therapy, we're going to play with that threshold. You should still carry your uh, auto injector because of those cofactors, you could get a reaction even though you don't expect it. So, how does epinephrine work um, by turning on those, those mast cells? So, 
let's say that you, those are the mast cells that I put on the, the body right there. So let's say that you're eating uh, egg. So what's going to happen is that everywhere it touches your mast cells is going to start itching in your mouth, you get your tummy ache. So you're going to have your mast cells react. Um, that's going to give your local symptoms. Then at some point, you're probably going to start absorbing the allergen that's going in your bloodstream. When it enters your bloodstream, you're going to start getting systemic symptoms. You're going to start getting mild anaphylaxis. So at this point, the moment you know that the allergen is in your bloodstream, that's when you want to give the, uh, the epinephrine. It's because if you wait more, then, well, the allergen is going to keep getting absorbed, and you're eventually going to get that severe anaphylaxis. Once the allergen is out, uh, sorry, once the histamine is out of the mast cells, you can't put it back in. It's too late. So if you give you epinephrine, you're going to help with the breathing. You're going to help with your, 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 your blood pressure. But you wasted your chance to actually stop the reaction to prevent the, the, uh, the mast cells from degranulating. Now, let's repeat this and say the moment you get those systemic symptoms, you're at the level of a mild anaphylaxis right now, you give the epi. What's going to happen is that you're going to turn off those mast cells all around your body and they're going to be disarmed. So when the allergen is going to keep getting absorbed, you're not going to trigger those other mast cells. So those that have already uh, reacted, uh, well, it's too late for those, but good thing that the epinephrine is also treating the allergy symptoms, but you're stopping the, uh, the, the allergic reaction in its track. So that's why, why now we're really focusing the message on, you know, give the epi, epi is not dangerous, and don't bother about should I go to the ER or not, just start by giving the epi, and then afterwards you can decide whether you go to the ER or uh, or not. Okay, so now overall immunotherapy, what's the point of it and how does it work? So OIT is going to do three things to your body. The first thing is that it consumes the antibodies on your, uh, your, your, your mast cells. So this is um, the surface of your mast cell and the um, antibodies are there and they can see the allergen. So when you have a bunch of antibodies that see the allergen, there's going to be a signal given to the uh, cell because of the, the, the tails of the, the receptor in the cell. It's going to trigger a signal for your, your, your mast cell to activate and release the, the histamine. The idea is that if you give only a tiny amount of the allergen, the signal is not going to be strong enough for it to react. So the idea of, of OIT is that you're going to give small amounts of the food that are enough to stimulate your mast cells, stimulate the IgE antibodies on your allergy cells, but not enough to give a reaction. And the idea is that regardless of whether you've made your mast cell react or not, those antibodies that you uh, use will be eaten up by the cell, digested, and then you recycle the anti receptor for the antibody on the cell surface and replace those with new IgE antibodies. So you say, well, that was completely useless. So you just replace them with the same antibodies. But that's the thing. It's not necessarily the same antibodies. It could be an antibody to peanut. Again, let's say that 20% of your allergy antibodies are against peanut. That's what's going to happen. But it could also be Ig antibodies against anything else you're allergic to. So what that means is that if you expose yourself progressively to small amounts of peanut, you're going to start getting rid of those antibodies against peanut and replacing them progressively by other allergy antibodies in your mast cell. So eventually, your mast cell is going to be less sensitized to peanut and not react as much to peanut. So you'll be able to give a bit more of your allergen. And then by giving more of your allergen, you're going to disarm it even more. So the, the principle of uh, OIT is you start with small amount and you start disarming your allergy cells progressively and give more and more and more. And as long as you keep giving the allergen, you stay desensitized. If you stop giving the allergen regularly, progressively, your mast cells will rearm and the allergy will come back. In parallel, if you keep exposing yourself to the allergy, you remember your white blood cell at the beginning that made the mistake of calling peanut a bad parasite and it started producing those antibodies. If you expose yourself to something you're allergic to, it's the same principle as a vaccine. You're going to start producing more and more antibodies against it. But if you keep doing it every day, you're going to exhaust this response. The body's going to start understanding that it's not dangerous. And eventually, in some patients, this might be enough to exhaust it completely and make the allergy go away. So what can happen with an uh, with a OIT is that, well, usually your IgE is going to start going up. You're basically making yourself worse at first because you're stimulating the allergy. But if you keep going, it's going to start going back down. And where it's going to end up 
you know, plateauing might be lower than where you were before. If that's the case, then you've improved. It might come back exactly the same level it was before, then it's basically the same. It might actually end up higher than it was before. Uh, so technically you're more allergic than you were before. And what we see in infants, when you start very early, soon after the diagnosis, is that you're going to suppress the IgE and it's going to go down uh, rapidly. So that's why we really want to start oral therapy as early as possible in children before the allergy has time to expand itself, because it's easier to sensitize when you don't have that much antibodies. But not just that, before you've established that immune memory, you're able to re-educate your immune system and suppress the production of those, uh, those IgE. And the third thing that's going to happen to you when you do uh, oral immunotherapy is that you're going to start producing protective antibodies. So those antibodies will appear pretty much regardless of those other situations you're there. Pretty much everyone that does oral therapy or other type of allergen immunotherapy will start producing those. So what do those do? Basically, they do nothing. They just stick to your allergen and do nothing. But immunologically wise, I mean. But that's actually a good thing because it's competing with your uh, with your IgE antibodies. So those are mostly going to be in your bloodstream. So it's not really going to help with your local symptoms. If you have IgE, you're still going to react in the mouth. It's going to itch. You're still going to react in the stomach. It's going to hurt. Uh, but when the allergen is going to enter your bloodstream, before reaching the mast cells in the tissue, it has to go through your, your blood, which is full of IgG4 antibodies against peanut. So the IgG4 will neutralize the allergen. It will take up the spot where usually the IgE would recognize it and prevent it from reaching the uh, the mast cells. So typically what we see in people that have high IgG4 and stop oral therapy, the itchiness will come back in the mouth, the tummy aches will come back, the nausea will come back, but their threshold for having anaphylaxis will actually be much higher. So small amounts, which used to trigger anaphylaxis before, don't tend to tr trigger anaphylaxis anymore, don't tend to trigger systemic symptoms. And if they keep eating the food, well, eventually you might saturate those IgG4 and you will eventually reach the mast cells and get your, uh, your, your anaphylaxis. But for accidents to small amounts, um, that can actually be an outcome that, that's good for patients knowing that, you know, if I get an accident, I'm going to get the local symptoms, but my likelihood to get a full-on anaphylaxis is actually pretty low. So that, that, that makes me feel safe if I want to travel uh, or if I just want to taste the food that I'm not 100% sure uh, hasn't been in contact with, uh, with, with an allergen. So biologically speaking, uh, what's the potential outcome of a desensitization and, or an oral therapy. So the way I presented, there's the desensitization of your allergy cells. So that's really dependent on you taking your dose every day. It's consuming your uh, IgEs uh, on the, uh, the the allergy cells. I, I, I call it partial when people say, well, thanks to that, I'm able to tolerate a bit more of my allergen. I'm able to increase my threshold. I used to react to trace amount. Now I can tolerate traces. I eat half a peanut a day, I'm fine there. If I eat five peanuts, then I'll react. So I'm not completely desensitized. I call it partial desensitization. Or now I eat half a peanut a day and I go in clinic and we eat 50 peanuts and I still don't react to that. I call it complete desensitization. Compared, uh, we, we call it stable when it's easy and uh, you, you can stop, you can skip a day or two and the allergy doesn't come, come back. I call it unstable when the moment you skip a dose, uh, reaction starts uh, coming back. And it's really something that's dose dependent. The more food you eat, well, the higher you're going to push your threshold. The second mechanism, making your, your IgE uh, change, uh, we really see that mostly in infants, suppressing your, your IgE antibodies. The final result is really difficult to, uh, to predict. The young age and your starting IgE, if you have low IgE, it's more likely that we'll be able to suppress it than if it's really, really high. Um, and the interesting thing is that it does not seem to be dose dependent. Um, the jury's not out on the minimal amount that you need to take to, to get the effect. But before we used to aim for like 10 peanuts or, or 17 peanuts a day to maximize this effect. Now we know that, you know, there's not much difference there. One peanut a day seems to do it. And there are studies now looking at one peanut a day. And what we're getting from the uh, sublingual and epicutaneous immunotherapy routes, which consist of getting either a drop of uh, peanut extract under the tongue uh, every day, very, very diluted, or a patch, like a nicotine patch, but peanut. So there's basically one thousandth of a peanut in a patch that you put on the skin every day. You expose yourself, you get the, the same effect on your, your IG that you would have with oral therapy. Is it as intense, uh, as effective? We don't know because we don't have studies that compare 
uh, the two head to head, but it's the same type of effect. They get on changing your IgE and IgG4 uh, response. Uh, so even with those tiny, tiny uh, doses. So if you want to reach high doses it's because you want to reach higher threshold through desensitization, but if your goal is really to re-educate your immune system in the long run, um, the dose doesn't seem to, uh, to matter. It's more being regularly exposed, that's important. And then the third mechanism is developing those specific protective antibodies in your uh, bloodstream. And we see that pretty much in any patients, older like younger, severe like milder uh, allergens, and regardless of the route that we take to do the sensitization. Same thing, doesn't seem to be uh, dose dependent. Um, it's something that persists over time. If you stop your desensitization, you will still have your IgE, they're, they're, they're being produced by other white blood cells. But how long will this stay? Will it still be there in five years? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we, don't, we, we don't have uh, uh, the experience yet with enough patients in which we follow them over time uh, to know. Uh, so what we, I tend to tell patients that stop oral therapy, um, if we can follow the IgG4 in clinic, that's great. If we don't, I have them keep exposing themselves periodically just to make sure they're not losing that uh, protection. Okay, so maybe we'll just finish with uh, three three cases, uh, just just to see how how these concepts could apply in a discussion where you're considering uh, oral therapy uh, or not. So here we have Kathleen. She's uh, eight years old. She's been allergic to milk since pretty much always, potentially birth. We don't know. Um, she had a few anaphylaxis to other food, but nothing major to milk. Uh, she has a mild but very well controlled asthma, and she's mostly interested in milk OIT uh, right now because this is the allergy that's causing her most limitation in her day to day life. Her IgE levels are at 16, uh, and her total IgE level is close to 1000. So when we look at her, she has a low ratio of her Ig antibodies over the total. So that means that every time you're going to flush an Ig antibody on your mast cell, you have almost 99% chance of replacing it by another antibody. So that, that should give us a stable uh, desensitization. So in this case, I would say that this is a good candidate for desensitization. Um, how high will we reach? I don't know. There's a lot of protein in milk, uh, but reaching at least a certain amount of protection uh, that's actually better than the threshold, increasing the threshold that she can tolerate right now, I'm very confident we'll be able to at least do that. Um, Am I confident that we will be suppressing the IgE, re-educating it? Uh, that's unlikely. Uh, it might improve in part, uh, but to suppress it completely, usually we only see that in infants and uh, in, uh, in toddler. So we're not looking, we're not thinking about curing her and not really thinking about inducing remission uh, either. Curing, we usually we don't like this word, but we, we would say someone that where the edge is completely gone and never comes back, that would be a cure. Remission is we, we put you in a state where you can eat the food, stop desensitization, the reaction doesn't come back, uh, but you might still have some IgE. We, we like the term remission because it implies that there might be some white blood cell that's going to come back and the allergy could come back eventually. And we know we're going to be able to, to generate IgG4 protection in, uh, in her case. So that's how I would present it to them. Then we would say, with regards to her objectives, what she's looking at, um, and her, 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 her social context, if it's a good idea for her to undergo OIT uh, or not. Now we have Liam, that's a different case. He's only nine months old. Um, he had a recent accident to raw milk. Uh, he failed a baked milk challenge. So uh, his IgE against milk is also low, has total IgE at uh, 2000. So technically a good candidate for, um, for, for, for milk desensitization. And the question with the parents is, should we start milk OIT right now? or way to see if there's spontaneous resolution. Because you know, with milk allergy, 80% of patients will outgrow it spontaneously. So that's a discussion we'll have with uh, the parents. We know that, th so the big question is, if you wait, there's 80% chance of it going away spontaneously. So we might be doing OIT for nothing in this patient. But you need to remember that if you are going to act, you want to do it as early as possible, because the more you wait, if you're in that 20%, which you have long-term permanent uh, allergy, you're giving time for the allergy to expand and amplify, and you potentially are losing this window of opportunity to induce your uh, your, your tolerance. So really in this case, uh, for me, this is a good candidate for desensitization. It's a good candidate to potentially try to change the natural evolution of the allergy and suppress those, uh, those IgE, and we'll be generating IgG4. So really the question is, how do you feel with the, the possibility of potentially doing it for nothing versus uh, 
not taking the risk of missing that uh, opportunity. And then I have uh, Dylan here, who's 21 years old, has cow milk IgE at 41, but his total IgE is actually pretty low. So 40% of all his IgEs against milk. So every time that you consume a milk, uh, milk antibody on your mast cell through OIT, you're gonna still replace it with another milk antibody. So this is gonna give you an unstable decision. It's likely to be difficult. Uh, it's an absolute, sometimes people have high ratios like this and it's, 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 it goes well, um, but most of the time it's tricky. You don't want to skip doses. You're likely to get reactions with cofactors. Um, this guy has had multiple ex episodes of anaphylaxis with small amounts, so has you know a very low threshold, um, so it's hard to manage at home. So that's you know when we talk with him, we say, well, you know, what's your objective? You're probably not going to be able to reach 250 milliliter of milk, but is increasing your threshold a little bit. An objective for you. He's extremely motivated. That's very important. So, so this is the kind of things we need to talk about it because he needs to have a real, realistic expectation of what to get from the treatment. So, in his case, I would explain that you know we can do desensitization, but it's going to be tricky, and I don't think it's going to be full desensitization. It's going to be unstable, but we can try it, uh, and he might get benefit from it. You can forget about you know curing his allergy or even uh, achieving re remission. We, we don't see that uh, in adults. The, the allergy is established, so the IgE uh, will still be there. Um, but he will, for sure, develop some IgG4. How long will this stay if he stops treatment? We don't know. But these will help at least with systemic reactions with, with anaphylaxis, even if he stops treatment. So that's that's a plus. That's a potential benefit. And then, well, we'll go from here and we'll we'll just talk and see if that's something that's uh, that fits his personal objectives. And I just want to figure finish with this slide uh, on future treatments. So so right now we only have basically two options to offer patients: either you do nothing, uh, well, you avoid the food obviously, and and you're always prepared with your epinephrine to treat if there's a reaction, or we do oral therapy. Um, there are new things that will probably come up in the next year or or, or decades. Um, the one that's closest is probably anti-IgE medication. Uh, you might have heard of it, it's Zolaire. It's quite expensive, it's a biologic medication. It's a, actually an antibody that's targeting your allergy antibodies. So it's preventing them from attaching to you, from arming your uh, your mast cells. At high concentration, it can also take them off the mast cells. So it's basically inducing a desensitization of your mast cells pharmacologically. On top of that, because in your blood cell, you still have the IgE, uh, so in your bloodstream, you still have the Ig antibodies that's there, but it's neutralized. So that can actually neutralize the allergen if you eat it without activating the mast cells. You're kind of creating artificial blocking antibodies, artificial uh, IgG4. So when you think about Ig medication, you want to compare it with oral therapy. What it does is it also disarms the mast cells in a pharmacological uh, manner. Um, it's not going to do anything on your, uh, it, you're going to get that blocking effect for anaphylaxis, but it's not going to do anything on your underlying allergy. So if you take that medication, the idea is you, you take it for the long term. When you eventually stop it, your allergy is going to come back uh, afterwards. Um, other treatments that are coming, uh, sublingual and epicanonous immunotherapy, we've mentioned before. So it's the same principle as oral immunotherapy, but instead of eating the food at higher doses, you really give only tiny amounts of the food uh, through drops under the tongue or a patch on the skin. So what's it going to do to your uh, body is basically the same thing immunologically wise as the uh, the OIT with regards to your blocking effect and re-educating your Ig. So if you're doing it in an infant or toddler, you're probably going to suppress the, the production of your allergy antibodies. Uh, but the downside is that because you're not giving high amounts of the food, you're not going to get this increase in the threshold in the short term of your uh, your allergy. And you're, you're not going to reach very high, as high amounts as you would have if you were actually eating one peanut every day. Uh, but if your goal is to work on the underlying allergy, uh, that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's the way to go. Um, Another thing is combining the anti-IG medication with your OIT. Um, this is basically going to do the same thing as doing uh, OIT, uh, but it's probably going to make it safer. There are people working on modified allergens that don't react uh, as much. And then there's combining, potential studies looking at combining oral therapy with immune modulators that will increase the chance of developing uh, tolerance and modulating your response. And so this is really... Uh, just research at the moment, but this is really for the adults, which can potentially hope in the future 
that will have treatments that will be able to induce remission for them or, or cure the allergen, not just desensitize them. All right, so that was a lot of biology, I know, uh, but but that, that was the goal. That was to be different from what you've heard before. If you have more uh, questions right now, uh, more about uh, how that applies to clinic, uh, I'm happy to uh, to answer them now. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Bijan. I invite you to turn on your webcam and I'll do the same. Okay. That was quite a science lesson. Thank you. And absolutely, um, you know, an approach that's really helpful to patients to be able to understand what's actually happening in my body. And so I want to start there and just um, restate or have you kind of restate the, you know, what are the three things that OIT, and we'll focus for the time being on oral immunotherapy, are doing in your body. You stated these are the three things that are happening. Yeah. So give the that first back. Thing, when you expose yourself, it's going to consume the allergy antibodies on your allergy cells. So by consuming it, it increases your threshold. If you keep incre increasing that dose, it's going to keep increasing the threshold. If you stop eating the dose, you're going to rearm and you're going to lose that protection. So that's the first thing. That's the sensitization. Right. The second thing is going to re-educate your allergy, your your um, your white blood cells, and so over time, you're probably going to start producing less antibodies against the allergy. So this is something that we do see in the infants and toddlers before your immune memory is established. It's not something that we see in older children. It's not something we see in teenagers and adults. And the third thing that we see in all age groups is that it's going to stimulate your immune system to start producing other types of antibodies, which protects you against anaphylaxis by producing competing antibodies. They're in your bloodstream and they neutralize the allergen when it enters your bloodstream. So that doesn't do anything for local symptoms in the mouth and the stomach, but it decreases your risk of having anaphylaxis at small doses. Right. And that's something okay. that's going to remain if you stop eating the food because the antibodies okay. are there. Maybe not for five years, but at least in medium term. Okay, so now then when you were going through the cases and you were talking about the three different, uh, the eight-year-old, the 24-year-old, and then the, the uh, one-year-old, um, and you were, you were sharing with us specific IgE as well as total IgE. And you were saying, well, you know, in the older patient, the, the ratio between specific IgE and total IgE suggests that, you know, this is an, an opportunity for kind of a modulation. So can you explain to us just that concept, yeah. okay? And and also how people would know what their specific IgE and total IgE picture looks like. So the specific IgE is when your allergist does the allergy test in the bloodstream, that's what they measure. They measure your antibodies against peanut or milk. The higher it is, um, the higher your chances are of being allergic, obviously. If you look at population-wise, the higher the amount, the more severe patients uh, will be when you do a, a challenge. When you're thinking about desensitization, you don't just want to see, well, how, where's my threshold, how severe I am. You want to see how likely am I to be able to disarm my allergy antibodies. So that other factor that's important is, what are my other allergy antibodies? Because when I consume it, it will get replaced. If it gets replaced by the same antibodies, we're going nowhere. So that's why you want to look at the total of allergy antibodies also and say, well, amongst all my allergy antibodies, what's the percentage of those antibodies which are against, for example, peanut? So if 1% of my peanut antibodies are against, uh, my, my allergy antibodies are against peanut, well, that's, uh, uh, that's good because every time I get rid of a peanut antibody on a mast cell, there's 99% chance it won't get rearmed with a peanut antibody. It's going to get rearmed with some other antibody. So that gives you a stable desensitization. So that's a good factor. Tell me it's, it's probably going to be easier than that other patient where half of their antibodies are against peanut. It can still be done. I mean, it, but, you know, you don't have a lot of wiggle room uh, because... It's, it's going to come back very fast the moment you stop eating the food. Uh, and, and even when you consume the antibody, there's a chance it rearms against with the same uh, antibody. So that's uh, that's going to be a, a more difficult case to desensitize. So let's say that I have a patient with relatively high antibodies against peanut. So people will say he's severely allergic, he has a small threshold, but he has also a very high amount of total antibodies. So his proportion of antibodies against peanut is not that high. I say, yes, he's very severe but I think we'll be able to desensitize him relatively 
easily. Why, well, if I have the opposite, I'm going to be very careful. Don't assume that it's going to be easy because you have a small test and your threshold is high. It, it might still be a, a rocky, uh, rocky desensitization. Okay. Now, what about people with multiple food allergy? Okay, and yeah. and or, or oral immunotherapy in kind of that multi-allergen environment. Can you do them all at once? Is there benefit in doing them all at once because you're you know testing more of the system? How does that factor in? So that's definitely an option. You could do them all at the the same time. Uh, it's not just a medical uh, question. In the end, is what's your objective? Because you're going to be you're going to have to eat those foods every day. So you have 15 foods that you're really realistically going to be eating those 15 foods every day uh, for the rest of your life. Uh, so usually people will focus on the foods that are more relevant to them. And that can be because they're staple foods which are limiting them in their day-to-day -day uh, lives, or they're the ones that have given them um, worse reactions before. Or it can be the opposite. If you're, you know, you're, you're more risk adverse. I don't want to, to even touch this one. That worries me. But those milder allergies, I, I'm willing to do something with it. Uh, so that's definitely an option. So there's not one answer to which food you could you should start uh, with. Uh, you have the option of either doing them one at a time. That's interesting because you know you learn whether OIT is for you or not, and then. Once you have this experience and you're able to move on with the other ones, depending on your, how it, it went, uh, the the downside to that is that you have to go through the process multiple times. So if you can do, if you know you want to do them all, it might make more sense to do them all at the same time. So then you start with small amount of each of the food and increase all of the foods at the same time. What's going to happen is that if you have a reaction and we have to decrease, we won't know which foods. So we'll just decrease them all and increase them all back up together. Uh, after that, but it's that that's an approach, and that's something we'll usually do when someone is uh, receiving a treatment like malizumab, those anti ig antibodies, they're receiving it for whatever reason, like for, for asthma, but you don't have them forever. So, because they cost a lot, and the insurance company is not going to pay forever, so we want to take advantage of being in that situation where we're protected. Um, so, in average, when you give a treatment with those medications, you increase by 80 or 100 fold your threshold for the, yeah. the food allergy. So it's interesting to take advantage of that to do your desensitization while you're there safely. Sure. Right, so combination therapy, especially yeah. for multi-allergen uh, OIT. Okay, now there's been some questions about, you know, safety and risks, okay, and, and adverse reactions. So uh, talk to us about that in the context of oral um, immunotherapy OIT. Yeah, so, so, um, the, the whole concept of uh, of, of safety and, and threshold, it, it's very complicated in food allergy. There's no other disease where, where you have uh, this situation where you, you have a, a risk that's basically always there, regardless of what you do. And in order to avoid that risk, um, you have to avoid doing certain things, which is going to impact your life. So the impact of food allergy, yes, there is the risk of death, but that's actually objectively extremely small. When you look at the burden of food allergy, the burden is mostly from all this impact on your life, from all the things that you avoid doing because of the food allergy. So when you look at threshold, um, you're, you're just trying to readjust the, the message, say, well, you know, how much do I need to stop living in order to protect this? Or how much can I keep living and assume this risk? And right now there was a one size fits all message that was completely inadequate, uh, honestly. And the patients are not stupid. They would realize it, but then that would cre create friction between patients and doctors, patients and, and their parents, because you realize when I've eaten it and you know I didn't die. So stop saying that I will die automatically if I eat it. It's false, it's not true. So we need, we need to tell the truth to, to patients. You know, we're worried that people might not understand and have risky behaviors, but you know, we need to engage in that discussion. And when you start accepting this, then obviously people want to know, well, okay, but what's my actual risk if it's not the same for, for everyone? So that's why we want to start incorporating threshold in the practice, uh, start looking at it, recognizing that it's not an absolute and it can change. But from my experience, patients are smart and they understand this message. Doctors are are, are more risk adverse because they, they don't want uh, patients to have accident and it being their, their faults, which obviously uh, I understand. But we need to, to find a, a middle ground when you, you, you know you give the patient autonomy, you give them the information and you accept that they can make decisions based on that information. From my experience, patients love having this this information, not necessarily because they will go and have the food, some of them right. after doing the threshold challenge or immunotherapy, which increases thresholds, 
they still avoid exactly as they were before. But knowing this, it still changes their life because now they know. So the issue with triage can be uh, summarized in one word, and it's control. You lose control over your life. With threshold testing, with oral therapy, is you have the control over your food allergy instead of the, the reverse. Okay, so and now I, we've got about five minutes left. Are you okay, Dr. Bijan, if we extend this by about 10 minutes to get to a few of more course. questions? Okay, of terrific, course. thank you. So on this question of thresholds, and understanding the evolution of your allergy, since it's not, we don't know that it's constant. You know, what do you recommend people uh, do with their allergists to better understand where they're at? What what's the what's the practice, and is that practice different if you're an adult with a persistent allergy or a child? What's your what's your thought on that? So the, the biggest issue we have in allergies is an issue of access. So first of all, having an allergist, that's already uh, an issue. Even if you have an allergist, oftentimes uh, they don't have access to, to, to hospitals or, or a place to actually do the, the, the challenge. So not all allergists offer oral food challenges uh, or they do, but there's a waiting list of two years to, to get it. So that, that's, that's a systemic issue that, that we have uh, that, that we need to work on at a higher level you know what we can do uh but but let's let's forget this issue and if if it's available and you're you're able to uh to do it um so you, you need to discuss it with your allergies they're not necessarily all going to offer it uh to you even though it is an option because there's a waiting list so so they they focus on those patients which are, are looking for for diagnosis uh, but if it's something that's important to you well just bring it up with your allergies see if they're willing there's a difference uh, between a patient that's asking me for a threshold challenge and me telling a patient they should get a, a threshold challenge. For, for, for the allergist, if, if you ask for it, then it's already clear to them that, okay, you understand that I, I'm not telling you you're not allergic by doing this. You understand that you're probably allergic and you just want to learn, and this is something that's obviously useful for you. You're asking for it. Um, they might be more open to it uh, than you think, even though they're, they're not offering it, because a lot of patients don't, don't worry about it. So, so you're not gonna start uh, creating more work uh, than, than you need to. So, so, but but engage to your allergists in that uh, in that discussion. Um, there's more and more literature that's coming out in, in the allergy uh, journals um, that you know are 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 managing this. So it's it's becoming more and more uh, standard uh, practice. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's standard now because it's, it's not that available. Uh, but I would say that most people are open to the concept. Uh, but we hope to be able to change our practice in the coming years to make it more and more available to, uh, to patients and make it normal as part of the, the, the normal practice. Okay, I've got a few more uh, specific questions. So there was one that came in regarding cofactors with menses. Is that something that during, if you're undergoing uh, immunotherapy, oral immunotherapy, if a young woman is menstruating, do you give different advice during that? How much does that cofactor play into reactivity? Yeah, that, that's a good point. So before I would system, um, uh, systematically uh, talk about it. Um, now from experience, uh, I, I mention it so they know it exists, uh, but I tell them it's, in my experience, it's only like 25% of women for whom it, it plays a role. Uh, so so I, I, if, if it's an issue, then we'll, 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 we'll work on it, but don't assume it's gonna be a problem uh, right off the bat. Okay. Um, any evidence on the use of probiotics uh, with oral immunotherapy and its uh, effectiveness? No, so, so that, that, that was a, a good hypothesis that maybe it would help um, because in, in, in mice, we know that uh, the, the, the gut uh, microbiota is going to affect your becoming allergic uh, or not. Um, so there was this, this study where they combined the two, but there wasn't a control group not getting the uh, probiotics. So it was peanut with probiotics versus nothing. So obviously it, it worked, but we didn't know if the probiotics were really doing something. And then afterwards there were other studies and they didn't show that the probiotics uh, changed something. The thing is, once you have an established allergy, it's very hard to erase your immune memory because part of your immune memory is in your bone marrow. It's there and it's just, the edge is being produced and there's not much you can do to change it. That's where we, we're looking at immune uh, treatments that will eventually be able to go there, um, but that's really for the, the, the future. And that's okay. why you want to act earlier while your immune response is still being building up 
but it hasn't installed itself in your bone marrow right. for life yet. Got it. Okay. Three more questions. Immunotherapy, does it work for pollen food syndrome or some people call oral allergy syndrome? Yeah, it works. Um, you're, you're, the issue is mostly in the mouth because that's where the allergen is. Uh, but there are protocols in Europe uh, where you eat an apple every day and it's just going to consume the allergen. Uh, it's a fruit, so you need to be willing to eat fruit uh, every day. Uh, but uh, yes, it, 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 it also works. So okay. that's something we focus on because we have long waiting lists, so we focus on the more anaphylactic right. types, but uh, yes, it works. Okay. Um, now, in this is a few, uh, uh, looking for some tips on um, mixing food allergens, like when you've got, you know, a child that doesn't like the taste, taste of nuts, like how do, how do you deal with getting the allergen in when there's a taste so, uh, so that was such a big issue that uh, now we have a nutritionist full time dedicated just to that, uh, and now it helps a lot because we have an expert. So, so she has recipes to help uh, for each of the different foods, um, giving alternatives. Uh, you know, one thing we need to be careful is when we consider, oh, it's a picky eater, it's a picky eater. They, they want to, so. That, that's the thing when, when, when kids are very young, we, we want to go early, um, but there are sometimes just orality uh, uh, issues. They're not there yet in their uh, development. Um, so, so, so this makes it, uh, this makes it uh, harder. Um, a nutritionist can help you with this, a pediatric nutritionist, because they're, they're used to dealing with the, these kind of uh, things. But you need to be creative. Uh, one thing is we always think about sweet stuff to mask taste. But don't forget about savory. That that you know, for some people, um, savory will do it. It will mask it much better than than sweet stuff. Okay. And the last thing is around access. Okay. Is that you know how do we? It, it seems like there's different options by province, and I'm not sure that uh, you can speak to this necessarily. But what's your recommendation to people on this front? And then I I'll also offer some of Food Allergy Canada's perspectives on this as well. Yeah, that, that's a really big uh, challenge. So yes, every province is uh, is different. Um, the, the, there's a question of, you know, the, there's not enough allergists around to treat everyone with allergies, period, not even just food uh, allergy. So so if, if you just look at the province of Quebec where I'm at, there's now a system where family doctors can refer in a portal uh, to, so, so that's just referrals coming from family physicians. There's 100,000 referrals in waiting for 75 allergists in the, the province. So that's not that's not working. Um, so there, there's a part where we need to reorganize and stop seeing stuff that doesn't need to be seen by an allergist, like mild hay fever, like history of penicillin allergy. 10% of the population thinks they're allergic to penicillin, and 99% are not, and the, you don't need skin tests. The, the family doctors can do most of this, but the, 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 the practice has always been, I have an allergy, I need an allergist. If you have diabetes, right. you don't need an endocrinologist. So, so this right. is true. for the patients themselves. Um, it's really trying to get to the, uh, the 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 allergists and then ask them if they're willing to do it. If, if they're an allergist that's not comfortable doing it, then having them refer you to an allergist that uh, that is uh, offering it. Um, but then the the pressure to change will come from the patients. So what right. changed stuff in Quebec was. Uh, patients asking their MPs and eventually the, the government uh, to make this available. And then the government right. went to the allergist and hospital and say, well, you need to make this uh, uh, happen. Perfect. Okay. okay. Well, the just, allergist asked yeah. the government, they're not going to get anything. Yeah. yeah. No. And, and just to add to that, I mean, uh, you know, as an organization, we also are would recommend talk to your allergist and get some pressure in the system around the interest in therapy and the interest in treatment. Um, and we are going to be in 2024 initiating some advocacy campaigns. We've got an update of our National Food Allergy Action Plan that will be focused federally, but we're also um, looking to do some things provincially. And to that end, in the survey that we've got post this webinar, we're asking you some questions about your challenges and access and your level of interest on advocacy. So. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's great, Dr. Béchin, that you've been able to spend the time and really help us understand the science behind this, and it, gi it gives us the confidence of exactly how the therapy and how the treatment can actually make change. So, um, appreciate your time. We, I, I, we've got five past the hour here. I've got a couple of slides, but I wanted to thank you for uh, taking the time to, uh, to uh, take us through the science and the effectiveness of this. Okay, so just a few more slides and we'll turn off our webcams at this point. So um, 
a, what's next in terms of our uh, resources, et cetera. So as I mentioned, following this session, you'll get a short survey through GoToWebinar that asks for your thoughts about today's webinar. We'd like you to take a moment to complete that and also to um, give us some insights around access uh, challenges that you might be having. But also this is a way that we identify what our programming priority should look like and provides us the insights on other topics that you'd like us to cover. We're planning our 2024 schedule now. And so, you know, if there's some topics that you want to learn about in the new year, please let us know. Our end of year holiday campaign is now underway and we recognize that you are Canada's food allergy future and that with your support, we can make transformational change together. So visit foodallergycanada.ca backslash donate before the end of the year to get your tax receipt. We can't do this important work advocating on your behalf and offering free educational programs like these without support. So thank you for your consideration. Visit foodallergycanada.ca backslash holidays to get some access to our free holiday resources like our party hosting tip sheet to help you and your family manage the holiday with confidence. And we also wanted to make you aware of a current research study that's happening right now for children with peanut allergy. The researchers are seeking children's age four to seven years of age to test an investigational drug patch uh, to potentially desensitize a person with peanut allergy. So visit vitesseallergystudy.com for more details. And lastly, we'd like to uh, thank our supporters. So today's webinar was supported by the Schroeder Foundation, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, EpiPen, the Peanut Bureau of Canada, and made possible from the donations of viewers like you. Thank you for your participation in today's webinar. You can review a recording of this webinar at foodallergycanada.ca shortly. Please also share it with others who you think may benefit from this content. This now concludes the webinar.